Um, all right. Thanks, David, um, for the introduction. Uh, so I gave a talk in this series last year, um, which was focused on um, silent earthquakes in New Zealand and based on a drilling expedition that I that, that happened not long before uh, all the lockdowns. Um, and so based on some questions that came out of that, I thought it might be useful and of some interest um, to zoom out a bit and talk a bit more generally about um, the, the research we're doing on silent earthquakes or slow earthquakes, terms used interchangeably, um, uh, why we're doing it and why this has sort of become an interesting topic over the last couple of decades. So since I can't see my audience or know your backgrounds, I'm going to just start with some basics um, and start with something slightly different in, in what, what we know of or how we define earthquakes as a normal earthquake as opposed to a slow earthquakes. Um, and these are you know, the kind of events that hit the news when some um, earthquake happens in an urban area or a, a um, populated area, creates some damage coming from you know, what we observe at um, seismometers as seismic waves that arrive abruptly. So um, things are quiet, um, a P wave arrives, then an S wave arrives, and then surface waves arrive. And this happens over seconds to minutes. And it's generated deeper in the earth by motion on faults, um, which we've long known relates to elastic rebound. So uh, if you look at this series of cartoons, from the top left, you have a fault going through area of defense. Um, over time, um, those rocks, rocks on either side of the fault are dragged in opposite directions, creating stresses on the fault until those stresses overcome the strength of the fault, the fault slips quickly, regains, catches up with the rocks around it, um, and you have an earthquake. It's a bit like snapping your fingers, pull them together for some time, stress builds up, and then it snaps. You make a sound wave, a bit like a seismic wave. Now, that's preserved in rocks in some places. And if you think of rocks sliding next to each other or against each other very quickly, it's a bit like rubbing your hands. It's going to get hot. It's going to get very hot. Um, and you create melt along some fault surfaces. So you can find some rocks in, in the field. These photos are from Lofoten, where we've been working on these sort of features for some years. Um, and you find faults coated in this black material with uh, bits of wall rock in it, uh, recording earthquakes. You can follow those from some distance. So you know, the characteristic of an earthquake is localized fast slip uh, on faults. Slow slip is something that um, we've only really known about for the last couple of decades, except for a few earlier um, observations and mostly in California. Uh, but as a global phenomenon, uh, it's really something we've found out about from the much increased coverage in, in GPS surveys over since really the late 90s. So there's a map of North America, Vancouver Island, um, GPS sites scattered around uh, in shown by rectangles. In this place, the Pacific is moving northeastward and it's pulling North America with it. So these black arrows are the long-term observations on the GPS sites. Um, and that's what you see if you um, record over a long period, but occasionally it turns out that the GPS changes direction and goes along these red arrows. So basically moving backwards. So what we'd expect is that uh, the surface would move northeast along the black arrows, and then in an earthquake, it would bounce back. But it turns out it also bounces back much slower than that once in a while. And um, this is an, a, a graph from one specific station. Movement to the northeast brings the, the dots upwards with time. So you see from um, 200 days after the 1st of January, um, motion is slight, very slowly to the northeast, and then the direction reverses over a period of 10 days or so. So basically what you're seeing here is magnitude six, seven earthquakes. So you know, centimeters of movement 
at depth, which creates just a few millimeters at the surface, uh, happening very slowly, but much faster than if it was just moving at plate rate. Now, that was um, a study from the early 2000s. And at around the same time, um, in response to the Kobe earthquake of 1996, the Japanese increased their seismic network um, substantially. And one thing they realized in the late 90s, early 2000s, was they were seeing this signal. Um, so this is a weak shaking, very small amplitude waves over some period of time. You can compare it to an earthquake. This is 10 second scale bar. This is a 200 second scale bar. The Y axis is roughly the same. So instead of this sharp arrival you see of earthquakes, this so-called tremor happens with much noisier signal. It doesn't have the sharp arrivals. It has a much sort of more like a slight shaking that goes on for much longer. And they were seeing this signal for a few years thinking, oh, well, this is storms, wind. It, it basically looks like a meteoric signal. But um, Ubara sat down and looked at where it happened and when it happened, and it wasn't correlating with, with any known storms. And it was happening at multiple places at the same time. So it just didn't fit being noise. Um, and he managed to locate it. And on the map here, you see areas of earthquake rupture in red um, outlines. And all these noisy events happen just below that, or just, just inland of that. But if you think of a subducting slab in a subduction zone, inland means um, emanating from further depth, if, or from, from greater depth if they come from the same inland dipping fault. Um, and immediately after this came out, Canadians, which we, where we just looked at the evidence with slow slip, went through their seismic data from a period during a slow slip event. And um, you see the seismic record from multiple stations on the right. And basically you see exactly the same noisy signal recorded at several stations at the same time. So, and they, if they correlated when they see that with when they saw the slow slip, it turns out to be at the same time. So there's this phenomenon of slower sliding than earthquakes and a noisy signal coming probably from, in these cases, the subduction interface at the same time. So in terms of what silent or slow earthquakes are, the main point here is of okay, where this um, topic has come out from is that in the last 20 years or so, driven really by increased GPS coverage, um, GPS and seismometer networks worldwide have been picking up these new types of earthquakes where, which are related to tectonic movements, they're the same direction, um, but they're slower than um, normal earthquakes and they're faster than the average motion over time. So for some reason, Earthquake um, faults are accelerating for days to weeks, uh, but not getting up to earthquake speed. Um, it's, we're now seeing this pretty much worldwide. So I'm not going to put up a world map of where they are because that's becoming increasingly governed by just where the GPS network is good enough. But rather, if you think of a subduction setting, you have an ocean. Um, oceanic lithosphere pushed underneath the continent. Earthquakes typically happen at, within some depth range, here indicated by red areas. And these slower events seem to be, um, some of them are shallow, but most of them are at depth just deeper than where the earthquakes are. And similarly in some strike slip fault zones, especially San Andreas Fault in California, you see the same thing. Um, at depth below where the seismic ruptures are, there are patches, discontinuous patches of this, uh, these slow events, um, with some exceptions that are also shallower, but they're next to where the earthquake zones are. So thinking back to you know, normal earthquakes, we see them recorded in rocks because they create damage and melt along, um, and friction melt along localized surfaces, um, but how would we see these 
in rocks. How would we see it in the rocks if what you had is a silent event? Um, and what stops them from accelerating? Why don't we get? Why don't they get fast and damaging? Uh, so to look at that, we've worked for quite a while with some Japanese colleagues um, from Tsukuba University in Kyushu in southern Japan, um, based on the idea that this is an old cross section, but um, it illustrates the point nicer than any newer ones I could find. Uh, if you so here in Kyushu, we know there are slow earthquakes at depth. Now they are at 20, 30 kilometers depth, so that's well beyond anything you can drill. Um, so we need some alternative approach. And if you think of a geological cross section of a subduction zone, you have material being subducted along a fault. Then the fault tends to often step down, and the material that's got to some depth stays at that depth, but then is often brought up again along other fault systems um, later in, in time. So a lot of material that has been, you know, if you look at the material at the surface here in the cross section that has been down here at great depth, and it's been pulled up by, by later faulting. And if we look at that sort of um, rocks where we can identify them um, confidently, they look a bit like this. So they are often um, foliated, so a foliation caused by the ductile shearing at depth where rocks are quite warm and can flow, but they're also cross cut by many fractures that are filled by precipitates that would have precipitated from a fluid. Um, and you see various sort of geometries uh, of this sort of shape and quite intense groups of veins. And if you think about this noisy signal, whatever makes it, if it happens every couple of years and has lots of little slip events within it, it's got to create whatever it creates, there needs to be a lot of it. And so, and it needs to be happening at the same time as something that's shearing more slowly um, and in the same direction. So here's an example of you know, that interplay between of structures that at least represent an interplay between sliding at a different mode a deformation at different modes. We have a foliation uh, created by slow shearing, creates these black lines. Uh, that is cross capped by this fracture filled with quartz. But this fracture filled with quartz is again deformed and moved along by some foli the foliation that it cross caps. So it's something you can only really make by having rock slides, slip, slide, slip, and so on uh, multiple times. Um, and if you look at these veins in detail, um, and if I draw this a bit clearer, um, what you see inside them is many sort of surfaces that you can trace out. Um, I'm doing this quite quickly, but basically means that you know this has opened to create space. Something's precipitated there, and then you redo the, the process several times. Um, something like this. So you have a slip, slip along some foliations or some surfaces that are linked by um, uh, openings, so little, little jogs. You do that once and they fill, you do it again and they fill. And in the end, you end up with vent systems that are created by this multiple episodes of opening, sealing, opening, sealing. Now that's at a very small scale, but if you have that happening you know, over a broad zone at the same time, um, the model that we proposed with our Japanese um, colleagues is that where you get below the the locked zone where you have localized slip creating earthquakes, you end up with something that's that's a bit hybrid, where the overall zone might be shearing slowly, maybe being turned on and off um, by stress levels. But when the stress gets high enough to, to start shearing, 
or to start fracturing or slipping quickly. Um, it, it only goes so far before it dilates and dilation makes it difficult to accelerate. And also if you're driven by um, pressurized fluids, which you kind of need to have fracture at great depth, because if you think about it, you go deep. Um, it's very difficult to slide crack rocks when they're held together by a lot of pressure. The way to get past that is to have a, a fluid pressure that counteracts uh, the stress that holds the rock together, basically a lubricant, um, and that allows slip. But then when that slip starts, if that causes some opening, that creates space, the fluid goes in there, the lubrication stops, and the slip stops. Um, and what you would get in the rock record, if that's true, um, is basically what we see, that you have some sliding that creates an opening, um, pressure drops, which creates precipitation, which is why you get quartz in that opening. So that seals it up and strengthens it, and then you redo the cycle. Um, if we go back to the geophysical data, this requires a wide, um, low stress, wet um, fault zone, which if you look at the San Andreas, that's basically what we have. There's a, at least what's inferred. It's a fluid source inferred at depth. And uh, that fluid is supposed to, or is proposed, and we kind of see it with this um, map of seismic velocities, or resistivity, give it this one, um, where um, water has a lower resistivity or higher conductivity. Um, and it, if it, the lower resistivity in the fault, which is up here, might have to do with fluids flowing in there and then lubricating the system. Similarly, for Japan, um, so Japanese subduction zone, similar thing. Here it's um, ratios of, of seismic velocities showing you that where they're high, um, that's likely because of presence of fluids and then the area of slower slip, that's basically what we see. Now, that's a mechanism for, um, one mechanism for slowing things down or for having um, slower slip that you have great weakness because of fluids and therefore limited um, stresses. Um, the additional observation is that these, um, these vein systems tend to be limited in size, limited in length and form networks around some stronger bits, uh, or some stronger rocks. And so a way of um, limiting their length might have to do with uh, the surrounding um, rocks within these wider uh, deforming zones, which is something we're thinking about at the moment. Um, some models by Adam Beale sort of reproduces this, where here we plot strain rate. So the, the faster it is, the lighter, the, or the warmer the color. And that reproduces the limited length slip by having um, variations in, in strength. So stronger bits are purple. They don't deform much. The material that can deform because it's weak, for example, because that's where the fluids are, are localized or because it's a weaker material um, is uh, deforming slowly, but then where there's some interaction between the stronger material, you get limited length, faster slip, um, potentially then creating these limited size, limited speed events. So, Going back to my initial questions, how do you record silent earthquakes in the rocks? Possibly they have something to do with the vein systems um, that we see in mixed brittle and ductile shear zones. Maybe not all of those veins, but maybe some of them um, form this way. Uh, and what stops them from accelerating? Stress or strength variations in either in space or time, either limited zone that can slip fast so it doesn't get to speed before it slows down or um, strength variation in time where you need fluids, but as soon as you, you need fluids to slip, but as soon as you start slipping, the fluids move or the pressure drops um, and slip stops. So, you know, those are the sort of models we're looking at um, for these events um, that we're interested in because um, they're sort of a relative, still a new and largely unexplained um, phenomenon. And that's my 20 minutes, so, so I'll stop there. Thanks, Hake. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for this presentation. Um, 
I don't know if there is any question. I couldn't see any questions so far coming through uh, the chats, but we're really happy to take some questions. It could be fairly general questions. I think I have a general, like a very general question, uh, which is about uh, how long do you think it's going to take until we really understand what's uh, controlling this unusual type of, uh, of, um, of earthquake? Or actually, is it so unusual? Because it's something that was perhaps not so clear through your presentation, but maybe they are very common. I, I, I think that, yeah. Them. So I think 20 years ago, when they started seeing them, it sort of got, got looked at as a, this is a strange and unusual phenomena that seems to be just in a few places, especially um, so locally in, in Canada and in Japan, or in offshore Canada, um, offshore Japan. Um, but then, you know, over the last 20 years, just sort of one paper after the other with, with discovering these things in a new place. So I think the thinking over the last, only really the last few years has been going towards that, yes, they're probably very common. Um, how hard you have to look for them varies, but um, it's probably a pretty common phenomenon. Um, understanding them fully might, you know, it's, it's hard to put a time on that. Um, I think at the moment, there's quite a lot of focus by quite a few groups coming from experimental, numerical, geophysical, geological backgrounds. Um, and it probably needs those groups to start talking to each other uh, a bit more, um, although that's, that's starting to happen. And really get the boundary conditions down, knowing, I think we're getting very good at knowing what the observational data are. The geophysicists are, are ahead of the rest of us. And I think we're, We've hit that point where the observations are well constrained and the mechanics are not yet there. Mm. Um, so I guess we're, we're kind of where, where, we're, where we have the, the boundary conditions quite well constrained. And now it's down to um, figuring out what the mechanics are, coming up with the hypotheses to test with more observations and then, and then see where that takes us. Hmm. Interesting, thanks. Um... I think you, if you could unshare your screen, then we could yeah. uh, see you like full size if you prefer. So otherwise, yeah. you can leave us with the, the big questions. Yeah. No, uh, I think that Diana, who's going yes. to be our, our speaker next week, you want to ask her question. Yes, yes, yes. I would like to ask again. Uh, besides rocks, there is any other sign of the occurrence of these silent uh, earthquakes? Um, signs in what? In what way? Like, uh, I mean, the occurrence this, of these earthquakes, you know, or you can prove the occurrence of these silent earthquakes, looking at the rocks, yes? And the marks on the rocks, yes? Well, I mean, I think that's where we're still a bit, I, I don't think we know exactly what the signs in the rocks are. Uh, we, oh, know okay. from, we know from GPS that they occur um, at depths that we can't reach. All right, so, the GPS signal is clear, and the mm -hmm. interpretation and the modeling of the GPS signal is pretty clear at outlining the depths and the slip areas. Okay. Um, so we have those constraints. Um, so we, we've got constraints on geometry. Um, we have experimental constraints as well on what kind of conditions they happen under, um, and maybe what sort of structures they form. So there's, there's been an effort over the last years to try and find something in the rock record that fits. And, and there are some things that, that might work, but I don't think we've really seen something in the rocks that we can say, yes, that's definitely it. Um, there's quite a few things we can say that kind of fits, but um, we don't really know. So that there's a few places um, where we're trying to, where, where there are efforts to try and and track it in a better way or more directly. Mm -hmm. um, and the places to do it would be, I mean, there's, we had a cruise, a, a drilling cruise offshore New Zealand a couple of years ago where we put some instruments inside the fault zone that we know deforms by occasional slow slip event. So if those instruments happen to record an event like this, which is what we hope happens, um, then that would be a more direct ob observation. Um, and there might be some similar efforts in the shallow San Andreas fault, where you can also see some things near surface. 
Um, but the deep ones, the high temperature ones, become much more speculative just because of the, the limited data. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, probably another couple of questions. Uh, there is one that came through the chat by Diane. How back in time can you trace these occurrences? Ooh, good question. Um, so that comes down to, again, recognizing something in the rock record that we're confident about and then dating it. Um, so in the observing it actively, um, you know, obviously only the last few decades, because that's the only times where there's sufficient geodetic data. Geological record, I don't, I don't know whether there's necessarily a limit to how far back we can go. I mean, um, the sort of rock assemblages where anyone's come up with a, a model that involves slow events, um, they're typically in the last few hundred million years, but you know, basically wherever you have um, plate tectonics, I suspect. If you can get it before plate tectonics, that would be interesting. I mean, there are similar things happening in volcanoes where it's magma driven. So I, I don't see whether there's necessarily any time constraints, but that's an interesting point. Yeah, I think I think I think you've addressed this it reasonably well. Um, if it's not the case, please Diane, then just uh, feel free to post a follow up on the question. Uh, Duncan has raised a hand, so I don't know, Duncan, if you can unmute yourself or if you want to type in, in the chat to ask a question. Yeah, really can you hear me? Can you hear me yes, now, yeah? we can. Yep. Yeah, hi, Aki, I just um, was wondering, you showed how the slow slip events are below the seismogenic zone and then subduction zones. I was wondering if this is telling us or giving us more information about processes during subduction and in terms of like dehydration of particular minerals and does it confirm what we would expect or is it telling us something new, like where these are actually occurring? Yeah, so there, there's been some debate about that, but I mean, I think there's certainly places where it fits pretty well. Um, in that you, if you, I mean, it comes down to the, there's some issues with uncertainty in thermal models, but if you look at active margins, it the depth range fits thermodynamics and where you where you would expect the hydration reactions pretty well. If you look at single margins. If you try and group them, it becomes quite messy quite quickly. So I don't right. think there's a, a smoking gun kind of, it has to be the dehydration of this. It, it seems to more be uh, quite location specific. Um, yeah. But that seems to work. There's been a few sort of studies in the last few years that where, where it kind of fits. We've tried to do that um, on rock records as well. We had a paper in geology a couple of years back where we tried to link um, the timing and location of intense vein systems that might link to these sort of events to dehydration reactions, the dehydration of chloride. Right. Um, kind of worked. Chris Tully is trying to get something published that, that does that in a bit more detail on the Japanese margin. Cool. Um, Thanks, so yeah, I think that works. Um, I okay. see Diane. And there's that's the follow up uh, question by yeah, Diane. Yeah, added, but you could trace plate margins. But could yes, you could, trace plate margins? Yeah. You could. Um, the, yeah, so the challenge then comes with if you can trace the plate margin and you have its rock assemblages and you can strip away the exhumation signature and be confident that you're looking at the structures that date to a particular kinematic. Um, configuration in a particular time, then you would need to recognize something within those structures that you're confident relate to these kind of events. Um, so places that have done that, I think Japan, you could kind of argue that, that would date back to, um, well, those are Triassic or Jurassic. Um, I think the ones we've looked at are Jurassic. Um, there are some other places where it's a bit older. But again, the further back in time you go, the more overprint you have, and the harder it's going to be to tie down mechanics. So 
it, it gets very, yeah, it, the, the uncertainties are going to get very large very quickly. So how far back in time can you trace them is an interesting question that I think I'm at this point going to admit I don't have a, a definite answer to other than you know, theoretically, I don't see why there should be a limit because the physics that creates, I mean, I, I don't think there's necessarily an, an earliest earthquake. You can probably find that very early. Um, yeah, thank you, Ake. Okay. Uh, yeah, definitely still uh, quite a bit of work to do, uh, but it's also making uh, the whole idea or topic quite interesting to investigate, I'm sure. Yeah. And Diane's adding spe specifically South and North America. Sounds like we need to go for a, a coffee or a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Uh, yeah, it looks like it. Um, all right, so I think that's that's all the questions that I've come uh, through through the chat uh, and uh, people actually asking questions today. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so please remember these are public events. So we're really trying to get as many people from a uh, general public here and to have a, a discussion with not necessarily uh, uh, expert geologists. So I just want to point out a couple of dates uh, for uh, interesting talks that are coming very soon. There is uh, the next public lecture. It's going to be given by, I think, Jenny Pike from, from our school. She's going to talk about uh, very small organisms living in the oceans and how they're preserved as fossils through the geologic record. Uh, so it's going to be on site. You have to register to attend this, but it's a it's a it's a fairly nice event, I think, and you get also to uh, to to see other people in, in the room. So it's it's definitely good to uh, get a little bit of face-to-face uh, -face activities after a difficult uh, COVID year. And then there is also the next GeoTalk, which is going to be following exactly the same format. It's going to be on the 17th of uh, November. Uh, so Diana, we just asked a question a few minutes ago, is going to talk about social media and emergency response after earthquake. So we're going to, to speak a bit more about earthquakes, but uh, it's going to be a slightly different uh, focus. Uh, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing you uh, there. And yeah, if you like this sort of informal uh, webinar, make sure you make a little bit of noise because we can accommodate up to 1000 people. So we still have a bit of uh, room. So thank you all. Thank you. Uh, very much again, Ake, for joining us and giving us this uh, this talk today. Goodbye.